Hello Unity fans, it's time for part 2 of my series of videos in which I'm reviewing and also adding on to Catlike Coding's brilliant hex map tutorial. I'll link to the introduction and part 1 in the description, or you can follow the link in the top right right now to start at the beginning. At the end of part 1, we had our base geography ready to be populated. Today, we will be adding various features to the map. There will be buildings, farms and trees, but they will all use the same generic feature manager. Let's visualize the basic idea. Each hex has a defined center and six triangles. This means there are seven natural positions per hex to place features on. Some features, like special landmarks, work well in the middle of a hex, while others need to be scattered more towards the edges. Note that some of the six triangles may be disqualified as feature placement positions due to roads or rivers already running through them, but we show an otherwise empty hex here to convey the main idea. Note that we don't want all the features to be rotated exactly the same way, and we don't want to completely populate each hex like this, since this would not look organic at all. So we store repeatable random rotations for all features in a hash grid and we allow for a density setting for each hex. Some of the features are then randomly left out based on the density setting. Furthermore, differently sized prefabs are supplied for each feature type and each placement picks a random one to give us some variety. This can be repeated for each feature type and the feature types can even be mixed on a single hex. The final factor is perturbing the locations to shift each feature around a little bit inside its triangle. After completing the UI for the features, which works just like previous elements, features can now be placed on the map in many different combinations. While our features are placed on the flat centers of hexes, walls are placed in between hexes. Since they have to follow different contours, we cannot simply use a prefab like for the features. The walls need to be triangulated in another mesh. Each hex can be set as walled or not, and walls basically need to be constructed halfway between any two neighbors with different walled states. Walls are created with a thickness, a top, and caps on the sides to close them off. The largest part of this section is about adding random perturbations to the walls as well, making them follow terraces rather than having one long section making gaps for roads and rivers, handling interaction with cliffs and water, and then making sure that all the little holes showing up in all the special cases get cemented over. So our wall is now smooth and complete, but something very important is still missing. Something without which we would never have this. Watchtowers, of course. A watchtower prefab is added to the wall at strategic locations, namely on corners. However, not every corner gets a tower, and certain positions, for example on slopes, are disqualified. Towers are rotated according to the wall segment they're being placed in, and extend down low enough so they don't float above terrain that slopes down. Next, a bridge prefab is placed across rivers that have roads on both sides. The prefab is slightly stretched and rotated to fit the different possibilities of roads. Finally, some special features that are not allowed to mix with the previous features, water or roads, are created and placed in the center of hexes with a random rotation. We've been spending a lot of time creating more and more interesting maps with an increasing number of features, but we do not currently have a way of saving those maps for later. This is remedied in the next section. All the required information is stored in a binary file. Since our save file formats are still evolving, we also add a version value into our saves. In this way, we can keep track of which saves can be loaded by which versions of the project, and we can build in backwards compatibility. The most important factor in this section is that we change the format of some very important information of our hexes. We will not store hex colors, but translate each color into a texture index. This index indicates which texture should be applied to the hex, rather than which color. 
This will be required later when we bring in actual textures to replace the cell colors. As a first step when saving, all the integer values that need to be stored per hex are stored as integer32 format in the binary file. Adding the required boolean values brings the total number of bytes required to save the information of one hex to 45. We then look at ways of reducing file size, for example by saving bytes when we know the integer values are definitely below 255. We can also combine very small integers together into one byte, reducing the number of unused bits per byte saved. For example, river and road flags and directions. Using these simple tricks, we can reduce the number of bytes required per cell from 45 to 11, reducing our save file size by 75%. We also allow for the creation of blank new maps of different sizes to start over from scratch. All of this requires a rather large expansion to our UI. A pop-up window handles the creation of blank new maps and we require a save and load menu with a list item and scroll bar to allow us to save and load many different maps. Our final upgrade for this video is actually changing the solid colors to decent textures. Jasper or cat-like coding has got an entire separate tutorial on that, but I'm just going to describe the main idea here. We employ a technique called splat maps. Each single triangle that gets created in the mesh needs to be rendered with some texture. Since we have hexes of different geography next to each other, and we don't want the textures to sharply stop and start at the edges, there needs to be a gradual change from one texture to the other, just as when we merged the colors. Each corner of the triangle can be associated with one texture, and interpolating between the corner colors at every point within the triangle gives us the blending factors. If a triangle has the same texture at all three corners, the splat map has a single color throughout, so no actual blending occurs. Everything uses the same texture. But when one of the three corners is associated with a different texture, we need the triangle to render the first texture along its base, but then gradually change towards the second texture at the third point. If all three points are associated with different textures, the blending happens in all directions between three textures. We place our textures in a texture array that exists as a single object in GPU memory. We then define the three colors of the splat map and have to now go through each triangulation instance and make sure the correct colors are passed to the triangle corners. That's a lot of instances, but it's worth the effort when you see the solid colors change into actual textures. And that's it for this episode. Next time we will look at distances, pathfinding, unit movement, visibility and exploration. Please like and subscribe to stay tuned.